Good afternoon and welcome to part two of the CIM New Brunswick branch virtual event series on an emerging gold district in southwestern New Brunswick. Today we will be talking about carbon infrastructure and IOCG mineralization southwest New Brunswick and deformation alteration and mineralization in the Pocologan myelinate zone southwestern New Brunswick. My name is Holly Stewart, and I'm the Director of the Resource Development Branch with the Department of Natural Resources and Energy Development. I'll be your moderator today. Thank you for joining us. Some housekeeping before we get started. If you joined with your computer audio, make sure you selected the computer audio button on your control panel. If you dialed in with a traditional phone, ensure the phone button is selected. The meeting duration will be approximately one hour. Each speaker will present for approximately 20 minutes, followed by a five minute Q&A. Once both speakers have presented, there will be an opportunity to continue discussions at the end for those who wish to remain in the meeting. Attendees will be muted during the presentations. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in the control panel. The questions will be addressed at the end of each presentation. At the end of each presentation, you may also use the raise hand function to be unmuted to ask your question. Follow up contacts will be provided at the end of each speaker's presentation. We are pleased to inform you that the presentations will be recorded and available soon. Our first speaker today is Adrian Park. Adrian is from the Department of Natural Resources and Energy Development and will be presenting on carbon infrastructure and IOCG mineralization, southwestern New Brunswick. Welcome, Adrian. Oh. <clears throat> Shared screen over here. Okay, we're ready to go. Yes, please. Okay. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, what I, I want to do here is uh, go over some uh, recent structural analysis that's been based on uh, renewed regional mapping down in the St. John area and to the west down towards La Pro. This has been work undertaken by myself and my colleague here at, uh, at the department, Stephen Hines. But it also is the a culmination of 40 years of work by various people who I'll acknowledge at the end. <clears throat> Looking at this in the context of uh, IOCG mineralization, it's useful to have a working definition of what we're looking at. And uh, scanning through the literature on the subject, it's uh, a rather diffuse and nebulous definition but four characteristics seem to stand out <clears throat> in uh, all the various ways these are classified. First of all, they're associated with major regional thermal events. Adrian, can I interrupt? We don't see your presentation. You're not. Oh, no. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I, I haven't got a control for screen sharing at the moment. I'll end the show. Yeah. Go here. There we are. Where are we? Oh, there we are. Is that visible then? It is. You'll just need to go to slideshow. Slide Thank show. you. Come on. There we are. Is that still visible? That's Can excellent. You? Thanks, Adrian. Okay. So I'm trying to come up with a working definition of IOCG. I've basically uh, chosen four criteria which seem to that seem to exist by general agreement. And the first is that 
IOCG mineralization is usually associated with a major regional thermal event. Typically, you'd see low to medium grade metamorphism, uh, possibly maybe contrusions, and particularly A-type granites. The host rocks, particularly the host stratigraphy for these things, is generally iron rich and no reduced iron is present. So generally, they, these aren't coal bearing sequences. There's a regional scale alteration system on the scale of tens to hundreds of kilometers and evidence of two fluids being involved, an oxidized meteoric water component and magmatic brines. And particularly IOCG is associated with large scale crustal structures that seem to be controlling the hydrothermal plumbing. In terms of what these deposits are, again, definitions vary very broadly, but usually there's a big accumulation of iron oxide uh, these can amount to over a billion tons of iron ore, generally magnetite and hematite, but also substantial amounts of siderite may be involved. There's usually a sulfide component, and this is generally the host of quite large tonnage copper deposits. And with these, there are usually traces of bismuth and a host of other metals, but particularly from our point of view, gold. And then Peripheral to the main deposit, you very often have substantial amounts of uranium and rare earths. Well, the type example is Olympic Dam, South Australia, and others, Candelaria, have chosen at random from the Chilean iron ore belt and Corona in Sweden. And very often, individual deposits, there's a good deal of debate as to whether they should be included in the IOCG definition or not. I'm not going to go there. I'm just going to let that stand for the moment. Well, the large scale system we're looking at here in uh, the Maritimes and in New England is the Northern Appalachian tectonic collage shown here in white. And uh, that collage had basically come together by the early Devonian, with the exception of the Maguma terrain out here in so southern Nova Scotia. And the subsequent evolution of the orogenic belt is largely controlled by these huge origin parallel strike slip fault systems, of which the minus fault zone is one, the Norumbega fault system is another, and we're going to be looking at these down here in southern New Brunswick. So they control the post early Devonian deformation of the belt, and they're also intimately involved in the development of this post orogenic sedimentary basin, the Maritimes Basin, which ranges in age from the latest Devonian through to the earliest Permian. And again, these big strike slip faults are intimately involved in the evolution of that basin. This zooms in on the St. John area. And uh, just a quick background to the overall geology. The pre-carboniferous basement, we can uh, group into four categories, shown here in blue on the coast is the <coughs> Caledonia block. This is part of Avalonia and it includes Ediacaran volcanic rocks and intrusions. And they're overlain by a Cambrian Ordovician cover sequence, so called St. John group. In this shade of green in here, this statue, I suppose you could call that, we have the Brookville terrain. This consists of uh, Neoproterozoic sedimentary units intruded by a range of late Ediacaran to earliest Cambrian granites. Northwest of that, in very pale green here, is the Kingston terrain. And this is Silurian, early Silurian uh, island arc or magmatic arc sequence. And then further in void of that, we have various terrains that make up Gandiria. One other terrain worth mentioning is here in dark green. This is the, what we're calling the Partridge Island block. Um, this is an unusual Fermanian to Tornasian sequence of uh, <clears throat> predominantly basalts, some red beds, and they're intruded by early, cam early carboniferous granites. And the whole thing is intensely deformed and tectonically juxtaposed with the rest of Caledonia. Now, from the point of view of this talk, I want to look at this sequence of orange and pink down here. These are the 
Carboniferous cover rocks. Some of it is Mississippian, right through to where the pink is Mississippian to earliest Pennsylvanian, and the orange are fully Pennsylvanian. And unlike the same sequence up here in the Sussex area and out here on the New Brunswick platform, these Carboniferous rocks are also fairly intensely deformed. So deformed that uh, Sorry, the ver these various blocks is separated by these big strike slip faults. So we have offshore the Cobbaquid, which is part of the minus structure from Nova Scotia, the Caledonia Clover Hill Fault separating Caledonia from uh, Brookville, the Cannabicasis Fault separating Brookville from Kingston, and the Belle Isle Fault separating Kingston from the other Gandharian terrains. The deformation was noted by Bill Poole back in the 1960s. And he called it the Maritimes Coastal Disturbance. But the two names most associated with this zone are uh, Nick Rast, who claimed it was a fold thrust belt that constituted the front of the Variscan orogeny, correlated with similar late Carboniferous to early Permian tectonism in Europe. And then Damien Nance, working in the mid 80s, uh, offered a more integrated structural analysis and uh, termed it the Fundy Coastal Zone and recognized within here two large flower structures claiming that these structures form at a, trans at a transpressional restraining bend on this offshore Cobbaquid fault. So uh, I'm not going to go in, into the weeds with the stratigraphy but the units we're going to be dealing with by this Balls Lake formation, the lower of the two Carboniferous cover units. It's a red bed sequence. Locally at the base of it, we have marine limestones, the Parleyville formation, but more often than not, the Balls Lake formation sits directly on the underlying pre-Carboniferous basement. There's no real uh, Boss Point formation in the area I'm going to talk about. Instead, sitting directly on the Balls Lake, we have these two equivalent Pennsylvanian units, the Lancaster Formation and the Tynemouth Creek Formation. They have the same paleontological and, as far as we know, palynological pal assemblages in them, and they're both what was called Westphalian A, now usually referred to as the Lancetian stage of the lower Pennsylvanian. Below that is this Partridge Island block, which consists of the Taylor's Island Formation, which is volcanic, primarily basaltic with red beds, and the whole thing is intruded by the Tinus Point complex. We have some radiometric constraints on this. The uh, volcanic for Taylor's Island formation includes a rhyolite that we have dated right on the uh, Devonian Carboniferous boundary. And the intrusions include an uh, older Leucotonolite, early Tornasian, and an alkali granite, a real A-type granite that's <clears throat> later Tornasian. The whole thing is intensely deformed. Most of these rocks are myelomitic. And then we have a argon-argon cooling age for the whole complex, which is 340. So basically somewhere in the upper Visayan. So we're dealing with a very rapidly developed block of rocks, which are then uplifted, cooled, and then placed in the Lake Mississippian and they form part of the depositional basement to these units. Well, this is a quick overview of the structure that Damien Nance defined to the southwest of St. John. St. John is just off the northeast end of this map. And this is the Lawrenceville Peninsula, where he's traced the Caledonia Clover Hill Fault, a big right lateral strike slip fault, down into the Musquatch Harbour area and across the Musquatch Harbour to Gooseberry Point and Gooseberry Cove. These green rocks are the Partridge Island block, the blue is the Cambrian cover, and our Carboniferous cover are these yellow and pink units, and a yellow unit down here around Colson Cove. This is the Lancaster Formation, the pink is the Bowles Lake. Now, what, uh, what Damien analyzed here was that we have largely 
the vertical structures where the faults are in this orientation, showing right lateral strike slip. But when, when they turn into this orientation, as they do here and here, they become reverse faults with the hanging wall translating towards the southwest. And this is the origins of his flower structure associated with this stepwise development of the Caledonia Cloverhill fault, this big transgressional structure formed at the, at the restraining bend. Our remapping of the area has basically confirmed uh, Damien's analysis down here. But what we've done is to extend the extent of this flower structure into a newly defined feature up here, the Spruce Lake shear zone. And we can trace that from Spruce Lake, where these are Brookville rocks, there's a small carboniferous enclave trapped within here. And we can trace it across Musquash Harbor, down into the Chance Harbor area. And it splays with one half of it going along the northern edge of the Anderson Lake block and the other part going along its southern edge. This links in with a series of overthrust relationships that Nick Rast was aware of back in the 1970s, particularly associated with this feature here, which is the cranberry head granite, which forms a structural cleep, a uh, thrust slice sitting on top of carboniferous rocks seen here in the Chance Harbor area. Now, he also suggested that the Anderson Lake block was another thin skin of the hanging wall of a thrust. But uh, our, our remapping has demonstrated that the uh, boundaries of the Anderson Lake block, they're certainly tectonic, but they tend to be fairly steep faults, such as this one, which is dipping steeply to the southeast, and this one, which dips steeply to the northwest, in contrast to this thrust slice sitting on Cranberry Head, and these thrusts that we see here at uh, Port Ledge and Haley's Cove. These also bring granite over carboniferous strata. So this is uh, Damien's original flower structure, and it's three-dimensional rendering. <clears throat> and going back here, here are the continu con continuations of the Spruce Lake shear zone, which we're now seeing, which we're now suggesting is the northeast, northwestern edge of the flower structure. And this is our three-dimensional rendering it, rendering of it. Here's Damien's, Damien's flower structure. And we can see similar reverse faults bringing granite over carboniferous, granite over carboniferous, granite over carboniferous, right down here to the cranberry head clip. The whole thing then links back through the Spruce Lake shear zone. So rather than the Caledonia Cloverhill fault being the northern edge of the flower structure, it's now seen as being out here in the Spruce Lake Shear Zone, which links north into the Kennebecasis Fault Zone. It's a much bigger structure, in other words. Damien had the essence of it correct, but we're now seeing it as something larger. Well, down in Chance Harbor, Nick Rast recorded a uh, overprinting relationship of folds and cleavages, which gives us an age relationship between the Cranberry Head Clip, the southwestern tip of the big flower structure and the Anderson Lake block. We have early folds facing north, affecting Lancaster formation and Balls Lake formation related to this thrust slice of granite pushed over the top. There's a fairly flat lying cleavage, <clears throat> but when you come to the margin of the Anderson Lake block, all these structures are rotated around into a steep orientation. Notice the younging and facing information, and a second cleavage overprints onto the first one. Now that gives us a nice age relationship because it's telling us that this reverse fault structure is younger than the cranberry head thrust. And just to emphasize the point, on this cartoon, I bent that thrust around as it probably is rotated by this reverse fault movement of the Anderson Lake block. So possibly we're dealing with a another flower structure out here, where the Anderson Lake block is basically popping up between the two splays of the, uh, of the Spruce Lake shear zone. And we can show that this structure is younger than this structure. We can figure out a similar age relationship to the east of St. John 
I've been looking at the area down here. I'm now West St. John. I'm now moving to the east. The yellow is Lancaster Formation. The pink is Bulls Lake. And the green and purple are the Partridge Island Block. These are the colors out here, which we need to be too concerned with, are the various lithologies of uh, Caledonia. But I'll point out this belt through Cape Spencer is one of these Ediacaran volcanic and intrusive complexes. Rather than go into the detail on this, I want to show you three cross sections. <clears throat> this one here between Misspec Bay and Mackenzie Brook. This one through Beaver Lake. This one down here in Black River, because they show not only the structural relationship of these different blocks, but also give us an age relationship similar to the one I just showed you at Chance Harbor. First of all, this is to the southeast towards uh, Cape Spencer. This is going back towards Miss Beck and St. John. We have a series of uh, thrust slices bringing the Ediacaran basement over Lancaster in this case and over Lancaster and Balls Lake in this area, and a wedge structure and a back thrust taking basement over Balls Lake around the Mispec River. The early folds all face to the south. Here they are again, until you go over the other side of this wedge structure where the face of the uh, virgins changes into its mirror image. By the time you're over here, Convergence has gone back to verging towards the south. There's a second fabric developed here, and you can see that superimposed and overprinting the, early, the earlier one. This is the Beaver Lake section, and uh, again, east verging in this case of the early folds, east verging here, but with a very definite overprint of a north verging set. Going to the Black River, and this makes everything much, much clearer. Here we see the crystalline rocks of Cape Spencer, granites and, and volcanic rocks thrust over Lancaster and Balls Lake, and a very definitely a fold interference. The early folds are these overturned folds that are verging north, and they have superimposed on them south verging folds and a second cleavage. In other words, these south verging structures related to the structure of Beaver Lake and to the north is superimposed on the structures associated with the Cape Spencer flower structure. So it would appear we have three flower structures rather than one. Damien hinted that the structures at Cape Spencer were an early flower structure on the Cobbacoid Fault, most of which is actually offshore. You just see the northern edge of it where it's uh, reverse faulting out to the north. His main flower structure from Musquatch to uh, east of St. John is superimposed on the structures developed here. And then a third, we're suggesting a third flower structure centered on the Anderson Lake block is producing the overprinting relationship here in Chance Harbor. So, Let's call it a bouquet of flower structures. And they're evolving as the transgression moves diachronously from a focus here at number one through number two to number three out towards La Pro and Poca Logan. There may even be a fourth down here towards uh, Outsmaquoddy Bay. They're all happening, they're all occurring in a relationship with the Cobbacoid Fault, but through structures like the Spruce Lake Shear Zone, we now have a linkage into the Cannabicasis Fault and through Damien's structure into the Caledonia Clover Hill Fault. So while transpression in the restraining bend down here is generating these flower structures, the same faults are running out into the Maritimes Basin up to the northeast. Do we have any time constraints on this? Well, much of it hinges on the fact that the Lancaster Formation and the Time Mouth Creek Formation are involved in this deformation. And we have very good palynological constraints on their age. The spores we're getting out of the Lancaster 
and the limited information we have on Tynemouth Creek by both Langsettian, what used to be called Westphalian A. There is one radiometric constraint, and this was something Damien dug out back in the early 90s. It's an argon argon age on the tectonized granite of the base of the cranberry head clip down here. And their age was 317. Now with revised uh, decay constants, that pushes to about 319. The Langsettian Mantian boundary is around 316 or 318 as part of the Carboniferous time scale is uh, not terribly well defined. So we're looking at the deposition of the Lancaster formation and then the overthrusting by the uh, cranberry head clip, basically all happening in the Langsettian. This is a time interval of probably no more than two to three million years. We have one quandary, and that is back in the day, Nick, one of Nick Rast's students reported Westphalian sea spores, that's Balsovian, from somewhere down on the southern edge of the Anderson Lake block. We've sampled all the Lancaster formation around here for spores, and consistently we're still getting Lancetian. We haven't had a hint of anything younger, but we can't rule it out because we have no real constraint on the age of the Anderson Lake flower structure. It could be considerably younger. Well, what about the IOCG mineralization? That's so much for its structural context. What I'm gonna home in on are those examples that are emplaced into the Lancaster formation, which means they have to be Lancetium or younger. These are some examples from the Coverquid Highlands of Nova Scotia. They are typically very siderite rich, but also contain large amounts of specularite. Uh, but all, all three of these contain copper sulfides. This one has rather more quartz in it and there's pyritic material. A little closer to home, these are examples from around St. John. Uh, quartz veins cutting uh, Lancaster formation containing large amounts of specular hematite, minor amounts of copper sulfide. There are also these breccia type, which are full of siderite, blocks of uh, Lancaster formation, and a good deal of carbonate and quartz. This one doesn't really have uh, more than the gang minerals in it, but here they are quartz and calcite. There's also some pale siderite, and there's a blob there of, uh, of barite. And you also the, see these rather spectacular wretches around Colson Cove. We haven't found an actual outcrop of these things, and the suspicion is they actually came from the construction of the power station. But uh, this is a, a brecciated carboniferous granite, part of the Partridge Island block, and it's all cemented together with specular hematite. And in this case, you can see a lot of epidote alteration associated with this breccia. Just to give you an idea of the complexity involved, this is the Colson Cove location. On this side of the power station is a large carboniferous shear zone that is uh, shearing up one of the, one of the uh, carboniferous granites of the Partridge Island block. And here on the north side of that, we have St. John Group, the Cambrian or in succession, thrust on top of the Pennsylvanian Lancaster Formation. And the importance here is that this Lancaster Formation is some of the most thoroughly altered host to IOC to this IOCG mineralization. It forms veins, early, early deformational veins and post-deformational veins. And there's also a massive replacement of some of the sandstones. These aren't the best photographs you'll ever see. The uh, color is a, it's a little off. But here's an example of very deformed Lancaster formation. And you can see these slightly rusty weathering patches which are uh, siderite and hematite and uh, quartz carbonate. Some of them forming deformed veins like this one through here, and some of them massively replacing the sandstone. There we have the replacement type, and here we have 
a late vein, it's parallel to this face. And here you can see early veins, which are deformed along with the host rock. So where do we stand with this mineralization and those four criteria? Is there a major regional thermal event associated with this? Well, the A-type granitoids in the Partridge Island block are at least 60 million years older. And we have no recognized Pennsylvanian thermal event. Quite the opposite. If these big strike slip faults are associated with the development of the Maritimes Basin, in the Pennsylvanian, the basin is going into its thermal relaxation and subsidence phase, quite the opposite of the thermal event. The host stratigraphy, well, certainly the, uh, the Bowles Lake and uh, Lancaster formations are iron rich, but the Lancaster formation is coal bearing. Not economic coal, but there are certainly thin coals throughout the sequence. A regional scale alteration system tens to hundreds of kilometers in scale. At the moment, we just don't have the, uh, the data that allows us to say that this is the case, but we can say that this event does appear to be regional from the Coverquid Highlands right down into the St. John area. Large scale crustal structures that might be controlling the plumbing. The flower structures are probably the most obvious example of a, of a crustal scale, regional scale structural control. So really the conclusion of all, all the work so far is that this is not the Bariscan front. Damien has basically put the nail in that coffin 30 years ago, but we can, we can amplify that point. Instead, we're dealing with stripes, strike slip tectonics that are part of a system involving the, Cal the Cobaquid, the Cal Caledonia, Clover Hill, and the Cannabicasis fault systems. The basement structures are all related to this post-orogenic evolution and some of them to the evolution of Maritime's basin. We're left with the question of timing. I'm not going to steal Nicholas Thunder here. He's going to go into that in more detail. We can constrain some of these events to the Pennsylvanian. How young they are beyond that is a bit of an open question. And in fact, we have tantalizing hints from work that Sheila Waters did 20 years ago, dating the alteration at Cape Spencer. It's got a huge error on it, but some of that mineralization may well be Permo-Triassic. And that's actually moving closer to a major thermal event. And that thermal event, of course, is the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. Just a, a word of thanks to those who've gone before us and particular reference to the pioneers of this study, Nick Rast, the late Nick Rast, and Damien Nance, who's still very much alive and kicking. And finally, it's a beautiful area to work in, one of the most picturesque parts of, of New Brunswick. So I shall leave it there and ask for any questions. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Adrian. Great presentation. We could take a question or two. I would have a question. Nicholas. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, Adrian, um, you documented the basement rocks being trusted over the Carboniferous cover. Yep. Um, and I, and I remember there's also evidence that the basement rocks are record normal faults that are probably reactivated as truss faults. Do you think that the maritime basin may have evolved from the transpensional setting to a transpressional setting? And you documented the, the second part of that story? Yeah, the, uh, the Mississippian story in the maritime basin is one of strike slip you can demonstrate transgression and transtension from place to place. Uh, it becomes a more general subsidence in the Pennsylvania. But even at that point, some of these faults are active. And some of them certainly are reactivated early extensional structures. That, that happens all the time. There's inversion of many of these small basins 
at various times during the Carboniferous. So it's not necessarily a, a simple story from transcension to transgression. It's more like a, sort of a, a repeti repetitive story or it, both things might happen yeah. simultaneously. Yeah. And if you take a major strike slip fault yeah. like the copper quid or the Belle Isle, uh, as they evolve with time, unless, unless structures are absolutely parallel, it's almost inevitable that you're going to go from transgression to transtension back to transgression. It's simply the scale of it mm -hmm. that, that's different. Yeah, I think if, the, if there's one takeaway from this, it's that trying to figure out the evolution of this of this cell. Um, you really only can get a handle of it, a handle on it when you have good regiometric or uh, otherwise time constraints. We're lucky in that we have a good carbon for stratigraphy. And in your area, you're lucky because you, you've got good radiometric constraints. Mm -hmm. Uh, question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, since uh, I don't see a whole lot of questions here from my students uh, who should be on the ball here. Um, uh, obviously, there's a, a weird kind of diatreme breccia just to the uh, west of uh, Cape Spencer itself that yep. has a funny serpentinite-like matrix. Mm -hmm. And I wonder you, uh, obviously you mentioned uh, some of the other weird uh, brittle-like uh, breccia systems that are post-dating some of the stuff over towards Colson Cove that you showed us before. And uh, I'm just wondering if you wanted to speculate on what that is, because right now we really, it's really enigmatic to, uh, to us. Yeah, I, I'd agree. That odd breccia down at Mackenzie Brook is uh, got a kind of ultramafic, almost but highly altered matrix. There's uh, there are some mafic looking nodules in there, but again they're, they're very very altered. They're quite there's, there's no hematite associated with that as far as we can make out. And uh, the breccias from around Colson Cove, we simply have the suspicion that they came out of the construction of the power station. Yeah. Uh, so we're obviously not going to be able to examine that in detail, <laughs> but you don't wow. have that. You don't have that igneous matrix in there. Okay. I, sus I suspect they just they just brittle breccias along that that huge shear zone that you see at Maguire's Cove. <clears throat> but they're being emplaced. How are they emplaced? is the question I have. Uh, and I'm just wondering if they look like, because uh, the matrix and stuff that I saw looks like a, a serpentinite diapir like thing. So uh, obviously that has some implications. It would, if we, if we could uh, find anything else like that thing in the Kenji book, that would be very interesting. Yeah, and they transport heat as well. And they're yeah. synchronous with uh, major changes in uh, transpression to transtension in these systems. So anyway, right now it's an enigma. I'm not really sure how to figure out how to integrate that into uh, Alan's uh, Alan's work. Anyway, thank you. I would uh, I wouldn't bet on it, but uh, I have a sneaky suspicion that breccia could be triacid. Uh, okay, cool. <laughs> I guess we should do more to date, date it. Thank you, uh, Adrian, for a great talk. And uh, Holly, thanks. All right, thank you. Great discussion. We're a little bit over time. So what I'll, what I'll ask is that we move on to Nicholas. And then at the end, we can go back and continue the discussion. There'll be an opportunity to, to ask Adrian additional questions at that time. All right, our next speaker is Nicholas Piet Lazier. Nicholas is currently finishing his PhD at the University of New Brunswick and will be presenting on deformation, 
alteration and mineralization in the Pocologan my myelinate zone, southwestern New Brunswick. Welcome, Nicholas. Thank you. Just in case my supervisor is watching, I'm at UBC yeah. again. again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, welcome. Oh, sorry. Welcome to cool. UMB. <laughs> if you guys want to hire me, I'll, I'll change the, <laughs> the logo and stuff. <laughs> okay. Sorry um, about that. Dave was on the screen and, no and uh, I got distracted. <laughs> Just funny. Um, okay, so today I'll discuss uh, my work, my recent work on the Pokalagan Kinepicasis Shear Zone in southwest New Brunswick. Just as a reference point, Oops. where's my control? Okay, there it is. Um, we're basically moving 60 kilometers uh, along the Bay of Fundy from uh, Adrian's field work, and now we're looking at the basement rocks. Um, I'll divide the talk in four portions. First, I'll just zoom out at regional scale and give you an overview of why I think the Neocadian origin is an interesting collision in the context of the Appalachian origin, but also mineralization. And then we'll zoom onto the Pakalagan Kinebicus Shear Zone and talk about the interesting mineral assemblages that I've documented and when we did the field work there. And then we'll test the hypothesis that those mineral assemblages are related to hydrothermal alteration or metasomatism. I'll use those two words uh, interchangeably. And then at the end, we'll sort of link back into Adrian's talk and um, discuss how we might be documented a regional alteration system. So I assume everyone's a, a familiar with the Appalachian origin. Um, to, from my point of view, what I think is interesting with the Appalachian origin is that it doesn't record the final continent-continent collision and preserve most of its accretionary history. So on this map, I've located all the suture zone between Terrans and other shear zones. And the takeaway there is that a lot of the suture zones and shear zones were formed and reactivated multiple times during their history. And I think that's an interesting uh, feature of the Canadian Appalachian. When I started working in the Appalachian, I was confused by the multiple uh, tectonic events. And to sort of entangle that story, I looked at the timing of ductile deformation in the suture zones as a proxy for comparing my uh, local observation. And on this map here um, that I've modified from Keith, for, uh, Keith Van Sell's work, I've um, plotted the um, overprint of each of those collisions. And most importantly here in orange, if I annotate, um, we have only a Neocadian overprint uh, over Meguma. And most of my recent work has been uh, focused on documenting the Neocadian deformation at the regional scale. And we've seen this, uh, that it's present in the Eastern Island Shear Zone, in, um, in uh, Cape Breton Island, but also in, the, in, the, in New Brunswick and um, the Pukaragan Kinebicasis Shear Zone. And if I take only the shear zones that were, and then I compiled also the timing of deformation of um, as many shear zones as I could. And if I plot only the shear zones that were formed or reactivated during the Neocadian origin on this map, we see that the deformation of our print of the Neocadian origin is widespread. Um, we can go all the way into Gaspésie in Quebec, and we have the Grand Stabos Fault that's been formed during the Neocadian origin. Uh, the Belize shear zone and the Pokalagan Kinebicus shear zone are formed or reactivated. The Cape Ridge shear zone in Newfoundland. So there's a regional um, overprint of deformation during that time period. And then if we look at the mineral deposits, there's also quite a bit of mineralization that is uh, either especially associated or genetically associated to intrusions that crystallize during the same time period. So now I'll quickly cover them. So it's just so we have an idea of the variety that we're looking at. And Specifically, we'll be focusing on magmatic hydrothermal mineralization, so mineralization related to fluid exhaled from a magma. So in Quebec, in Gaspésie, um, there's the Mondelez copper gold uh, IOCG deposit, iron oxide copper gold deposit, and the Mont Parfait and copper mountain um, porphyry deposit. They might be genetically related or not. There's no, uh, there's no, it, it hasn't been documented yet. Um, if we move into the Minas Fault Zone or the Kobequid Chilabuco Shear Zone, we have the Copper Lake, Copper Gold IOCG deposit. 
And there's also the Cross Hill IOCG prospect in Newfoundland. And then there's also as well polymetallic mineralization associated to granite, such as the Mount Pleasant uh, deposit in uh, New Brunswick, the East Campville mine in Nova Scotia. And around the Eccle granite in Newfoundland, there's a lot of veins associated to polymetallic mineralization. And as I said earlier, all of these deposit prospects mines are either specially related or genetically related to uh, intrusions that crystallize during the same time period as their neocadian origin. So now we have a regional metallite, uh, widespread deformation and widespread magmatic hydrothermal mineralization um, related to intrusive that crystallize at the same time as the deformation. And we'll zoom uh, into the Pokologan Kelebekes shear zone, so like that purple square on the left, and see how um, the hydrothermal system related to uh, this potential magmatic hydrothermal regional system interacts with the deformation. And now we can use shear zones as uh, trackers for hydrothermal alteration. They're good conduits for fluid, and when they're, uh, the whole struct is metastable, it would tend to record the type of fluid that circulates through it. So it's a good target if you're interested in hydrothermal alteration and you want to use that as uh, for prospective mapping. Okay, now we zoomed on to, uh, zoomed on to the coast of the Bay of Fundy um, near Le Pro Arbor, just 60 kilometers west of uh, Adrian's docks. And um, if you're uh, by the way, if you if the camera is, is hiding part of the slide, you can click on the click on the oops, click on the um, click on the images and move it, and then you'll be able to see the rest of the slide. So um, in the area in the area, there's two main shear zones. There's the Belled Fault that formed as a sinistral strike slip fault and was reactivated as a dextral strike slip or shear zone. There's the Pokalagan Kinebekes shear zone form, that formed as a dextral strike slip uh, shear zone during the Neocadian origin. Um, the Pokalagan Kinebekes shear zone is separating the Pokalagan Harbor Ignis belt to the southeast from the Kingston Knife and the Pokalagan Metamorphic Suite, which is just the size of the Kingston Knife that has been metamorphosed. And then the Billen Fault is overprinting the Seven Mile Lake Metamorphic Suite. I won't get into detail in the lithologies. I think at this point, what's important is that I've been focusing mostly on the felsic to intermediary or to nice um, and to try to keep a constant protocol as much as I could. Uh, so we could sort of look at the same initial chemical composition when we're looking at the final assemb mineral assemblages. If we slice the area and make a cross section and look at the structures at depth, um, the focal against Kinebekes is sure is only steep inland, but as we move toward the southeast and the Bay of Fundy, the foliation becomes more shallow and it's slightly uh, showing open coals, but the mineral mediation remains constant and the kinematic indicator on the field um, remains constant as well, so it's consistently a dextral strike slip shear zone but it's cross cut by normal faults um, on the coast by the Bay of Fundy. So if I show you guys some field pictures, uh, on the left side, we have an, an example of the Pocket Again Kinebekes Shear Zone with the open folds. And on the lower right side, we have an example of uh, what the, the shallow foliation looks on the field and it's cross cut by uh, one of these faults. Now, if we look at the outcrops and we look at the fabrics and the mineral assemblage, um, here's an example with the quartz diorite where the foliation is marked by biotite. It's not very deformed. And if we move to another outcrop, but still with the quartz diorite from the Pokalagan Harbor in this belt, um, now we start seeing some nice shear bands indicating that top to the right kinematics or in the field it's a textural strike slip kinematics, also marked by biotite. But on the same outcrop, if we look at the high strain portion of the outcrop, um, overall we see that, okay, we see those nice shear bands, tuck to the right kinematics, extra strike slip kinematic, everything's good, other than the fact that there's a band full of muscovite cross-cutting the outcrop. And that's a problem if you 
if you think that these rocks evolve in a closed system and closed chemical system. So if we think about, about it in terms of metamorphic tetralogy, um, if we've been either uh, metamorphosing these rocks, either in the prograde path or in the retrograde path, if, it, if that were a stable assemblage, the mineralogy would just be the same toro. And the fact that we have those bands full of mustavite indicate that there's at least some fluid flow that were concentrated in some plane. So that could still be metamorphism, uh, but with different contribution of fluid, or that could be uh, metas metasomatism, where we've had fluid in addition of perhaps potassium, potassium in this case, that allowed to form those muscovite bands. And then if we look at the Pokolegan Kinemicus shear zone itself, and the protolith is much harder to identify, but if we imagine we're still with the same quartz diorite, uh, we see that the um, cytoclase porphyroclasts are fractured, much more finer grained. Um, and again, we have the same SM, uh, same biotized foliation. So what I did on the field is I sampled um, a deformation gradient across the shear zone, um, only using felsic to intermediary rocks, so I could keep somewhat of a constant protolith. And I took the thin section and mapped them with a tabletop micro XRF. What's neat with the tabletop micro XRF is that it's relatively inexpensive and you get uh, chemical maps for um, your thin section. Um, it's relatively reliable when we're talking about heavier major elements, but it's not really reliable for magnesium or sodium, so lighter major elements. But for a qualitative map like I did on the left, so there's a RGB composite image where the red corresponds to iron. So we can see, for example, the little bright red spots are magnetite grains, probably. Um, green is potassium and blue is aluminum. You can see the mineralogy that pops out immediately. And what I did, and we'll see that for the next few slides, is I um, sort the classified the mineralogy using a k-mean clustering algorithm. So on the right side, we see the mineralogy. So in dark blue, we have the plagioclase, in black, the quartz, and darker green, we have the potassium feldspar. And the advantage of using that technique is, well, you could also do some staining with acid. And you'd be able to see the potassium feldspar here crystallizing inside the, plagio the fracture of plagioclase. Um, but you also get the whole rock composition um, in relation to the texture and um, anisotropy of the texture. So if we move on to the thin section, but looking at the chemical maps or the, the mineralogy in this case, and we see, look at those mineral assemblages again, but in thin section, we see our, um, our starting assemblage with biotide forming the, those nice CS fabrics, indicating again that top to the right kinematic textural in the field. And then same texture we've seen on the outcrop, same type of protolith, uh, maybe a little bit more quartz rich than a quartz diorite. We start seeing those um, shear bands defined by muscovite which is surprising, a little bit more potassium feldspar as well. And if we go all the way to the like most different mineral assemblage, we see that again, those plagioclase grains fractured with potassium feldspar crystallizing in the pressure shadow and lots of miscavite. So overall, I've documented three mineral assemblages uh, in AKF metamorphic diagram. So, uh, and um, we'll keep for the rest of the talk those little um, uh, traffic lights on the left and that are pale blue, dark blue, and yellow, sort of a, as a color code for the three dimensional assemblage. There's zoisite biotite, miscovite biotite, miscovite and potassium feldspar for the third assemblage. And the second thing we'll do is we'll keep only the samples from the Pokalagan Arm Harbor Igneous Belt because we want to keep the same protolith. And the reason for that is we want to test the hypothesis that these rocks were met, uh, hydro, uh, metamosomatized or they simply recorded um, um, regular metamorphism in those are three different metamorphic zones. Or finally, we're just looking at three different protolith and I'm like, uh, I'm totally wrong. So let's look at those rocks now in terms of chemistry. The first thing I did is I, compare those rocks to um, the sample from Chris White from his study in 2002 as a proxy for the least altered specimen into an alteration box plot. Um, these plots are usually uh, used for exploring for VMS deposits. That's not the case. I'm 
mostly interested by this protolit box in the middle of the plot that gives you an expected chemical range for a normal orthonized protolit. What we see is okay, or at least altered specimen in gray and black plot within the protolit box, but our specimen from our third mineral assemblage, Muscovy and Palat and Telfar, plots outside the protolit box. And so their chemical composition is totally off from a normal orthonized protolit and way different than the least altered specimen from Chris's work. However, specimen from the second assemblage, Muscovy and Bytec, plot within the protolit box, but they follow a trend um, that would if you, according to large, uh, largest work or its paper, that would be a seawater interaction, but it, it, it would, could be static alteration as well. So we'll come back to that later. Uh, you can also do a mass balance calculation using a least altered protolith. And the takeaway there is that the third mineral assemblage with Muscovy and Potassium Telfar, that's totally different from uh, that. And we know that this the whole rock composition of that assemblage or the specimen that have that assemblage is um, significantly different from a normal orthonized uh, and from our least altered specimen, is enriched with at least 150% of sodium, 50% of potassium and silicon, and depleted in iron, magnesium, and manganese and calcium. And our second specimen are also uh, our second mineral assemblage, the specimen from our second mineral assemblage, that's a little bit uh, uh, confusing, are also uh, enriched in uh, sodium, potassium, and silicon, and depleting in iron, magnesium, and manganese. Um, now, the question is okay, uh, we know that at least one part, one of our mineral assemblage represents in a hydrothermal alteration, uh, but how can we name it? Um, so, here I've, I've used the um, IOCG diagram as a discriminant diagram for the type of hydrothermal alteration. And instead of plotting the data as a point, I've used the barcode from Olivier Blain's work. Um, the barcodes are simply the cationic proportion between uh, these major elements. There's two of them. And the neat thing with that is that a normal rock that hasn't recorded hydrothermal alteration will first would plot within the protolid field, which is that sort of potato in the, in the center of, it, in the, center of the, the, um, the graph, but we'd also have a balanced proportion between those calcium and calcium. So it would look pretty much like our legend on the right. And what we see quickly is that our specimens are way too rich in sodium and a bit too rich in potassium and maybe silicon and aluminum. And if we go back to our textures in the field, uh, our specimen from our second mineral assemblage, Muscovite bipite, plot toward a sodic alteration trend, while our specimen from the third mineral assemblage, Muscovite and potassium feldspar, plot toward a potassium alteration, uh, potassium alteration field. So now we know that we have a sodic alteration and a potassium alteration synchronous to the ductile deformation in the Popolagan kinebecus shear zone. So we have um, two, two of the elements of our metallotech, if we come back to our initial slides, and we have active deformation and active hydrothermal alteration, but we don't really have magnetism or anything uh, related to that crystallized during the neoikid and orogeny in the Popolagan kinebecus shear zone. So something's missing. Um, so now I'm going to link back into Adrian Park's work, and I think that we we have the missing piece here because he dated some granites that are Neocadian in age. And what I did is I took his whole rock data from the rocks that he documented in his paper from 2014 and just threw it onto the IOCG diagram just to quickly see if we see the same chemical patterns in the specimen. And of course, we see a static alteration or a trend toward a static alteration in his leucotelonite and a trend toward the potassium alteration in his alkali feldspar granite. So the takeaway here is that you can use whole rock geochemistry as a quick tool to sort of discriminate or let's say clean up a little bit and look at where, you, where we should you focus if you're interested in some specific hydrothermal alteration and you can map them on the field. Um, so I think that's an interesting thing. You don't need to use expensive equipment or techniques 
uh, just some good quality field mapping uh, helps to um, map the hydrothermal alteration at the regional scale. So now at the regional scale, we have um, active deformation, active hydrothermal alteration, and magnetism during the Locadian origin. And we sort of go back into our initial metal effect and we know that we have it locally. And then the last interesting thing is that we can link this system, if we assume it's part of an uh, iron oxide copper gold alteration system, to what we see in the Minasphalt zone and uh, in Nova Scotia. And now we can start thinking about this system, uh, this system as a, at, a, at a larger scale. So I think that's the future of, uh, of, that, uh, of that project here. So as a conclusion, the Pokalangan Quebec is this year's own recorded sodic and potassic alterations during the Noakedin origin. It might be related to an iron oxide apatite mineralization system, but you need to find potassic iron or calcium iron alteration. There's some um, indication that that may, might be present in the Pokalangan metamorphic suite. There is uh, an old iron and gold prospect, and there's an old iron mine, and they're related to magnetite. Um, and when you look at the Pocal again, can make it this share zone, there are lots, there's lots of magnetite in the foliation. So that, that's probably an indication that's the hydrothermal deposit. It's not a bedded iron formation, but you need to have a look at it to confirm that. Um, and the last takeaway is that these hydrothermal alterations are fairly easy to track using whole rock geochemistry. Usually um, the overprint of that type of alteration totally overtakes the initial composition of the protolith. And that means that you can be a little bit less um, discriminant in the way you use them, at least if you just want to target some areas quickly. Going forward, um, it would be interesting to document this alteration system at the regional scale. Um, and I'm currently doing some geochronology to better uh, to get a better handle on the, the timing of that hydrothermal alteration. So I'd like to thank um, well, my co-authors, uh, I should have put their name here as well, uh, but also the feedback I, I got from Charles Quadars from Brunswick Exploration and Osisco Metal. And I've got that help from Suzanne Johnson and Adrian Park uh, from the New Brunswick Survey. And also I've got help from Luis Corvo, Jean-Luc Pilote from the GSC and Olivier Blain from the BRGM and Nicolas Gaillard, who just graduated from Negro. And of course, there are different funding sources. As the last uh, PSA, I'm involved in organi organizing uh, IOCG short course proposal for GACMAC 2022. Uh, Erin Adleka is leading that proposal. Um, so the short course would be targeted at industry people. If you're interested, um, send us an email. And we can just let you know when the short course, when the registration is open for the short course. And what would be super cool is if um, you have a geochemistry data set on hand, a whole rough geochemistry data set, and you think that you might have some of those hydrothermal alterations, you can come to the short course with that data set on end, or even better, send this, send this, send it to us ahead of time via email. Uh, you could censor some of the commodities that are a little bit more important, economically important, and even the GPS coordinates. And we can use that data set to give real life examples during the short course. So that would be super cool. You can, you're welcome to send me an email to my personal email address or contact me on LinkedIn. I just opened an account and jumped into the 21st century. So I, I thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, fire away. Thank you, Nicholas from UBC Okanagan. Uh, I really appreciate uh, I really appreciate the presentation. So I'll open the floor for any questions that you might have for Nicholas. If there's no specific questions for Nicholas, I'll open the floor well, for any questions. Uh, oh, sorry, I did, did I miss somebody's hand? I was hoping that other people would uh, ask questions before <laughs> I do. <laughs> All right, uh, go ahead. Gardner, in one of his um, 
a paper on the, the Cape Spencer property mentioned that uh, there is uh, an iron uh, hematite rich body. Has this been looked at more recently and where does it fit in this whole sequence? So I, I think it's a question for David Lenz student. Uh, he's got, a, I think, a master's student working on the Kent Spencer deposit, and um, I haven't talked to him, but I hope uh, I, I'm excited to see his results. Um, I, I think that's going to be interesting uh, going forward, especially if they date the mineralization and hydrothermal alteration there. Well, I sure look forward. Uh, you you made an appeal to industry to send you a lot of geochemical data. Well, uh, okay. We have done that uh, across uh, Canada now, and many industry have be, have been helping us in trying to uh, to revise our prospective setting and re-examine them. And industry data holds a lot of information on on potential alteration facies that are key to, to uh, make a prospectivity mineral potential um, map or reassess the potential of areas. And uh, well, I, I sure hope that uh, industry will, will tend to answer to, to your uh, request because it makes a huge difference when we have a vast uh, data set and then we can ask key question about all the alteration facies and then and then go back to the field and test many working hypotheses. Can so, I, uh, and Adrian, you, you've done an amazing talk and Nicola, you've done an amazing talk. I mean, this is fantastic to see all the work being done. So, well, thank you. Uh, merci, Louise. <laughs> okay, I, I'm just gonna quickly jump on jump on that and say, like, I forgot to say that those systems are fairly large and over and often overlap claim blocks. Um, we're talking hundreds of kilometers of scale, at least 100. You know? And so sharing data sets is actually an asset for everyone. Um, you're not losing competitivity. You're actually helping like, understand your neighbor's system, but also your own system. Um, so it's fairly hard for scientists or, or industry to find good quality whole rock data set that cover a large area. And I think the way forward is just to compile those data sets by sharing information from the from the companies themselves, and the 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 geological surveys uh, like the GSC or the New Brunswick survey are is a good place to do that because they're impartial. They don't have any economic stakes in that. Um, so I, I think it would be great if we can share that type of information at a larger scale. Are any other questions for Nicholas or Adrian? I think yeah, David Lynn student is you should you should, you should ask questions. Uh, for uh, for uh, the IOCG or uh, hematite rich bodies. Uh, uh, I would default to a yellow who has been doing the work with the uh, uh, New Brunswick government on those parts. Uh, that is not part of Alan Cardenas's PhD. It is more focused at the structural and, uh, and the gold mineralization that seems to be mostly uh, orogenic gold-like uh, associated with Cape Spencer. So building off of the earlier work. Um, but uh, I don't know if Aiello's online to be able to comment on the IOCG stuff that was specifically in Avalonian Brook, Brookfield train type rocks. I'll send you an email because I missed the last name of Alan, but I'll send you an email so I can get this last name and then I'll send you an email. Yeah, but Aiello is probably online. Okay. And he works for uh, his office is beside Adrian. So, uh, and uh, I haven't been kept in the loop on that project. I have done a bunch of scans so that they can do some geochronology related to that project. But I, I have no intimate understanding of that project because it isn't linked to a student here. Okay. 
-hmm. Well, if I can add something, uh, what Adrian has shown us are brain systems that can form at any uh, time within the reactivation of the systems that can have AOCG and affiliated critical metal deposits. And that's very important to, to realize that those systems are so much in disequilibrium that as soon as new fluid comes through them, they will re remobilize locally the metals and form a lots of veins, including what looks like orogenic gold. So each of those veins taken individually are not bringing us to uh, an OCG or affiliated critical metal deposit uh, mineral potential. However, collectively, when we start looking at the host alteration and the host mineralization, then that could really change. That could be a game changer. And in the Great Bear Magmatic Zone, it was fascinating to see that people had made beautiful channel sampling across veins. And the host rock was a mineralized breccia of belonging to those mineral systems that lead to OCG. And next door, we would have OCG mineralization. Or in other places, we would have our oxide apatite mineralization. So the focus on the veins and on dating the veins should never let us forget that those are the remobilization. Those are the last stages. And the big deposits are in the host rocks that people map as iron formation, as arcosis, as rhyolite, as amphibolite, uh, you name it. There's a great ability for people to map alteration zone as common metamorphic or igneous rocks. So, so we really need to re-examine the whole setting because you sure have some key elements but how far can we go now in finding the larger deposit, not just the vein deposits, which can be big. And I don't want to uh, diminish the interest of everything that has been found, but I think we have to look at the system scales again. So thank you. Well, I should add that not everyone's a specialist on IOCG, so it's easy to miss. I, I missed it when I was on the field. I sort of catched it while looking at my, my field pictures and my team section. I realized that I, I did something wrong and I should have noticed those assemblages. So I think it's fairly common to miss it and realize there's a larger alteration system later. That's why we're organizing a short course just so that we can share that knowledge and so, I, so, I, so we can learn it as well. Yeah, well, IOCG has been recognized in Southern New Brunswick for quite some time. Monster Copper, when they were doing the work on the exploration of the Shedbucto, Cobquid Shedbucto fault system and associated systems around there that had obvious copper mineralization through the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, they, uh, they did work there related to that. And that was somewhat recognized in Southern New Brunswick. Uh, although there are many different types of, you know, it's important not to uh, throw everything into the same grab bag uh, as well. And that's, that's the lesson from uh, the, uh, the more recent papers on IOCG. And that obviously uh, for IOCG, we're looking for uh, the right assemblages, the right timing. Uh, there's a bunch of different things. So uh, obviously uh, I'm just, uh, I would point out some caution compared to traditional uh, ways of producing gold mineralization in the absence of base metals, uh, like we see at, uh, at Cape Spencer, which looks like orogenic uh, gold fairly closely but we do see at least one piece of evidence of igneous activity that may end up being uh, good for uh, linking to some of the uh, geochronology that Adrian and the government of New Brunswick were involved with uh, just to the uh, west. So 
Um, but it's good to recognize all aspects of the mineralized systems that are around there. And, and there's also juxtaposition of other mineralized systems right beside, as we know, we have carboniferous uh, copper zone mineralization that is exotic copper just to the north uh, uh, along these things. So uh, those exotic copper are exhuming and weathering near surface uh, copper rich systems, which could be IOCG as well, and then getting remobilized into the basal carboniferous as it's developing. So there's lots of different types of things. So we have to always keep all that in mind. Also, just to note, it's always good to use the most recent geochronology when you're uh, pointing out. So Mount Pleasant is not uh, the young age that uh, Kaufman has noted from the old McCutcheon age that's since been dated three times, uh, showing that it's uh, 371 million years old and fits in the broad Neo-Acadian, which I, uh, I quite frankly find not very useful. Uh, it's Neo-Acadian is not exactly like that and neither is the Acadian. Uh, for a fact, uh, anybody who says the Acadian is as young as what has indicated in your slides actually uh, doesn't know what the Acadian is. And I would throw that out there to case because we have magmatic systems obviously cross-cutting Acadian known folds that are not selenic uh, uh, that are 420 million years. So, yeah. so uh, some people need to get with the program and really start tacking these down so that uh, we're not making these, uh, these erroneous statements. Yeah. Well, it's a severe critique, but I'll take it. Uh, uh, well, I'm not critiquing you. I'm just critiquing those broad types of things that where things need to be fixed. I think it just means I need to clarify. Uh, when I talk about the notion, I talk about the time event. So they're not necessarily related in terms of tectonic settings. And I think that highlights um, the missing point in our knowledge of the, the Ocadian originally. Just that widespread deformation. In magma oh. season, is it related to a single system or an overprint between the Acadian and New Acadian? It's yeah, no, about, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, my point was more the Acadian uh, and uh, the evolution of that. That so there's a big difference between uh, 362 and 363 million years old and 371 in a New Brunswick context. There's a huge difference in the styles of mineralization. And uh, that also relates in that middle to younger Carboniferous into the Permian uh, as well. So uh, tying these things down definitely is uh, very useful and uh, ha has been very useful to un unravel more of uh, the discrete uh, mineralizing systems that are in an area, but also noting that there are remobilization events. Uh, I think a lot of the new geochronology and ideas around the Cobquid Shetabacto that came out with uh, Georgia P. Piper's last paper, uh, detailed paper, really tells us some of the complexity that we should see within the um, southernmost part of New Brunswick as well. So, cool. so lots of good work coming out. This is great. Uh, New Brunswick on that map uh, that Ralph Romer did shows that there was almost no geochronology context uh, for most of New Brunswick, except for, say, some of the porphyry units like Mount Pleasant and some of our porphyries compared to Gas Bay and, and so on. Now that that's changing significantly. So and uh, all of this geochronology is going to help. Uh, unravel all that and give us better context on everything younger than the Selenic. Hey, I'd like to thank everybody for the great discussion. Um, thank you to the speakers today and thank you to all the attendees uh, for being part of the session. Um, I've shared my screen. Up next, we'll have our third session in this series. It'll be on Thursday, May 27th from 12 until 1.
Simon Craigs with SRK Consulting um, will be one of the presenters and the title of Simon's presentation will be announced at a later date. We'll also have Sue Johnson from Department of Natural Resources and Energy Development who will be presenting on the tectonic evolution of trains in southwestern New Brunswick, regional correlations and insights into mineral potential. In addition to that, I'd like to remind you of the CIM 2021 virtual convention. It's just around the corner on May 3rd through 6th, and registration can be found at registration.cim.org. That's registration.cim.org. Once again, thank you for attending. Uh, we really appreciate you being here, and thank you to the speakers, and we look forward to you joining us on May 27th for Part 3 of the CIM New Brunswick Branch Virtual Event Series on an Emerging Gold District in southwestern New Brunswick. Thank you. <laughs>